Ladies and gentlemen, it was Ayn Rand. Ladies and gentlemen, the subject of my talk tonight is ethics in education, but in order not to let it sound like a discussion of the non-existent, I should perhaps subtitle it, regretfully, The Annihilation of Ethics in Education. Let me begin by telling you a brief case history. When I saw Mr. X for the first time, I thought that he had the most tragic face I had ever seen. It was not the mark left by some specific tragedy, not the look of a great sorrow, but a look of desolate hopelessness, weariness, and resignation that seemed left by the chronic pain of many lifetimes. He was 26 years old. He had a brilliant mind, an outstanding scholastic record in the field of engineering, a promising start in his career, and no energy to move further. He was paralyzed by so extreme a state of indecision that any sort of choice filled him with anxiety, even the question of moving out of an inconvenient apartment. He was stagnating in a job which he had outgrown and which had become a dull, uninspiring routine. He was so lonely that he had lost the capacity to know it. He had no concept of friendship, and his few attempts at a romantic relationship had ended disastrously. He could not tell why. At the time I met him, he was undergoing psychotherapy, struggling desperately to discover the causes of his state. There seemed to be no existential cause for it. His childhood had not been happy, but no worse, and in some respects better than the average childhood. There were no traumatic events in his past, no major shocks, disappointments, or frustrations. Yet, his frozen impersonality suggested a man who neither felt nor wanted anything any longer. He was like a gray spread of ashes that had never been on fire. Discussing his childhood, I asked him once what he had been in love with. What? not whom. Nothing, he answered, then mentioned uncertainly a toy that had been his favorite. On another occasion, I mentioned a current political event of shocking irrationality and injustice, which he considered indifferently to be evil. I asked whether it made him indignant. You don't understand, he answered gently. I never feel indignation about anything. He had held some erroneous philosophical views under the influence of a college course in contemporary philosophy, but his intellectual goals and motives seemed to be a confused struggle in the right direction, and I could not discover any major ideological sin, any crime commensurate with the punishment he was suffering. Then, one day, as an almost casual remark in a conversation about the role of human ideals in art, he told me the following story. Some years earlier, he had seen a certain semi-romantic movie and had felt an emotion he was unable to describe, particularly in response to the character of an industrialist who was moved by a passionate, intransigent, dedicated vision of his work. Mr. X was speaking incoherently, but conveying clearly that what he had experienced was more than admiration for a single character. It was the sense of seeing a different kind of universe, and his emotion had been exaltation. It was what I wanted life to be, he said. His eyes were sparkling, his voice was eager, his face was alive and young for the span of that moment. Then the gray lifelessness came back, and he concluded in a dull tone of voice with a trace of tortured wistfulness. When I came out of the theater, 
I felt guilty about having felt this. Guilty? Why? I asked. He answered, because I thought that what made me react this way to the industrialist is the part of me that's wrong. It's the impractical element in me. Life is not like that. What I felt was a cold shudder. Whatever the root of his problems, this was the key. It was the symptom not of amorality, but of a profound moral treason. To what and to whom can a man be willing to apologize for the best within him? And what can he expect of life after that? Ultimately, what saved Mr. X was his commitment to reason. He held reason as an absolute that survived through the most excruciating periods he had to endure in his struggle to regain his psychological health. Owing to his determined perseverance and to the unusual competence of his psychologist, he won his battle. Today, after quitting his job and taking many calculated risks, he is a brilliant success in a career he loves and on his way up to an ever-increasing range of achievement. There are countless cases similar to his, but left unsolved. The same tragedy is repeated all around us in many hidden, twisted forms, like a secret torture chamber in men's souls from which an unrecognizable cry reaches us occasionally and then is silenced again. The person in such cases is both the victim and the killer. And certain principles apply to all such cases. Man is a being of self-made soul, which means that his character is formed by his basic premises, particularly by his basic value premises. In the crucial formative years of his life, in childhood and adolescence, romantic art is his major source of a moral sense of life. In later years, romantic art is often his only experience of it. Please note that art is not his only source of morality, but of a moral sense of life. This requires careful differentiation. A sense of life is a preconceptual equivalent of metaphysics, an emotional, subconsciously integrated appraisal of man's nature and the nature of reality, summing up one's view of man's relationship to existence. Morality is an abstract conceptual code. It is a code of values to guide man's choices and actions, the choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of his life. The process of a child's development consists of acquiring knowledge, which requires the development of his capacity to grasp and deal with an ever-widening range of abstractions. This involves the growth of two interrelated but different chains of abstractions, two hierarchical structures of concept which should be integrated but seldom are the cognitive and the normative. The first deals with knowledge of the facts of reality, the second with the evaluation of these facts. The first forms the epistemological foundation of science, the second of ethics and of art. In today's culture, the development of a child's cognitive abstractions is assisted to some minimal extent even if ineptly, half-heartedly, with many hampering, crippling obstacles, such as anti-rational doctrines and influences, which today are growing worse. But the development of a child's normative abstractions is not merely left unaided, it is all but stifled and destroyed. The child whose valuing capacity survives the moral barbarism of his upbringing has to find his own way to preserve and develop his sense of values. Apart from its many other evils, conventional morality is not concerned with the formation of a child's character. 
It does not teach or show him what kind of man he ought to be and why. It is concerned only with imposing a set of rules upon him, concrete, arbitrary, contradictory, and more often than not, incomprehensible rules, which are mainly prohibitions and duties. When a child's only notion of ethics, that is of values, consists of such matters as wash your ears, don't be rude to Aunt Rosalie, do your homework, help Papa to mow the lawn or Mama to wash the dishes, he faces an alternative, either a passively amoral resignation leading to a future of hopeless cynicism or a blind rebellion. Observes that the more intelligent and independent the child, the more unruly he is in regard to such commandments. But in either case, the child grows up with nothing but resentment and fear or contempt for the concept of ethics, which to him is only, quote, a phantom scarecrow made of duty, of boredom, of punishment, of pain, a scarecrow standing in a barren field, waving a stick to chase away his pleasures, unquote from Atlas Shrugged. This type of upbringing is the best, not the worst, that an average child may be subjected to in today's culture. If parents attempt to inculcate a moral ideal of the kind contained in such admonitions as, don't be selfish, give your best toys away to the neighbor's children, or if parents go progressive, and teach a child to be guided by his whims, the damage to his moral character may be irreparable. Where then can a child learn the concept of moral values and of a moral character in whose image he will shape his own soul? Where can he find the evidence, the material from which to develop a chain of normative abstractions? he is not likely to find a clue in the chaotic, bewildering, contradictory evidence offered by the adults in his day-by-day -day experience. He may like some adults and dislike others, and often dislike them all, but to abstract, identify, and judge their moral characteristics is a task beyond his capacity. And such moral principles as he might be taught to recite are to him floating abstractions with no connection to reality. The major source and demonstration of moral values available to a child is romantic art, particularly romantic literature. What romantic art offers him is not moral rules not an explicit didactic message, but the image of a moral person. That is the concretized abstraction of a moral ideal. It offers a concrete, directly perceivable answer to the very abstract question which a child senses but cannot yet conceptualize. What kind of person is moral and what kind of life does he lead? It is not abstract principles that the child learns from romantic art, but the precondition and the incentive for the later understanding of such principles. The emotional experience of admiration for man's highest potential, the experience of looking up to a hero, a view of life motivated and dominated by values, a life in which man's choices are practicable, effective, and crucially important. That is a moral sense of life. While his home environment taught him to associate ethics with pain, romantic art teaches him to associate it with pleasure, an inspiring pleasure which is his own profoundly personal discovery. The translation of this sense of life into adult conceptual terms would, if unimpeded, follow the growth of the child's knowledge, 
and the two basic elements of his soul, the cognitive and normative, would develop together in serenely harmonious integration. The ideal, which at the age of seven was personified by a cowboy, may become a detective at 12 and a philosopher at 20, as the child's interests progress from comic strips to mystery stories to the great sunlit universe of romantic literature, art, and music. But whatever his age, ethics is a normative science. That is a science that projects a value goal to be achieved by a series of steps, of choices. And it cannot be practiced without a clear vision of the goal, without a concretized image of the ideal to be reached. If man is to gain and keep a moral stature, he needs an image of the ideal from the first thinking day of his life to the last. In the translation of that ideal into conscious philosophical terms and into his actual practice, a child needs intellectual assistance or at least a chance to find his own way. In today's culture, he is given neither. The battering which his precarious, unformed, barely glimpsed moral sense of life receives from parents, teachers, adult authorities, and little goons of his own generation is so intense and so evil that only the toughest hero can withstand it. So evil that of the many sins of adults toward children, this is the one for which they deserve to burn in hell, if such a place existed. Every form of punishment, from outright prohibition, to threats, to anger, to condemnation, to crass indifference, to mockery, is unleashed against a child at the first signs of his romanticism, which means at the first signs of his emerging sense of moral values. Life is not like that, and come down to earth are the catchphrases which best summarize the motives of the attackers, as well as the view of life and of this earth which they seek to inculcate. The child who withstands it and damns the attackers, not himself and his values, is a rare exception. The child who merely suppresses his values, avoids communication, and withdraws into a lonely private universe is almost as rare. In most cases, the child represses his values and gives up. He gives up the entire realm of valuing, of value choices and judgments, without knowing that what he is surrendering is morality. The surrender is extorted by a long, almost imperceptible process, a constant ubiquitous pressure which the child absorbs and accepts by degrees. His spirit is not broken at one sudden blow. It is bled to death in thousands of small scratches. The most devastating part of this process is the fact that the child's moral sense is destroyed not only by means of such weaknesses or flaws as he might yet develop, but by means of his barely emerging virtues. An intelligent child is aware that he does not know what adult life is like, that he has an enormous amount to learn, and is actually eager to learn it. An ambitious child is incoherently determined to make something important of himself and his life. So when he hears such threats as, wait till you grow up, and you'll never get anywhere with those childish notions, it is his virtues that are turned against him. His intelligence, his ambition, and whatever respect he might feel for the knowledge and judgment of his elders. Thus, the foundation of a lethal dichotomy is laid in his consciousness the practical versus the moral, with the unstated preconceptual implication that practicality requires the betrayal of one's values, 
the renunciation of ideals. His rationality is turned against him by means of a similar dichotomy, reason versus emotion. His romantic sense of life is only a sense, an incoherent emotion which he can neither communicate nor explain nor defend. It is an intense yet fragile emotion, painfully vulnerable to any sarcastic allegation, since he is unable to identify its real meaning. It is easy to convince a child, and particularly an adolescent, that his desire to emulate Buck Rogers is ridiculous. He knows that it isn't exactly Buck Rogers he has in mind, and yet simultaneously it is. He feels caught in an inner contradiction, and this confirms his desolately embarrassing feeling that he is being ridiculous. Thus, the adults, whose foremost moral obligation toward the child at this stage of his development is to help him understand that what he loves is an abstraction, to help him break through into the conceptual realm, accomplish the exact opposite. They stunt his capa conceptual capacity, they cripple his normative abstraction, they stifle his moral ambition, that is, his desire for virtue, that is, his self-esteem. They arrest his value development on a primitively literal, concrete bound level. They convince him that to be like Buck Rogers means to wear a space helmet and blast armies of Martians with a disintegrator gun, and that he'd better give up such notions if he ever expects to make a respectable living. And they finish him off with such gems of argumentation as Buck Rogers, ha ha, never gets any colds in the head. Do you know any real people who never get them? Why, you had a cold last week. So don't you go on imagining that you're better than the rest of us. Their motive is obvious. If they actually regarded romanticism as an impractical fantasy, they would feel nothing but a friendly or indifferent amusement not the passionate resentment and uncontrollable rage which they do feel and exhibit. While the child is thus driven to fear, mistrust, and repress his own emotions, he cannot avoid observing the hysterical violence of the adult's emotions unleashed against him in this and other issues. He concludes subconsciously that all emotions as such are dangerous that they are the irrational, unpredictably destructive element in people, which can descend upon him at any moment in some terrifying way for some incomprehensible purpose. This is the brick before last in the wall of repression, which he erects to bury his own emotions. The last is his desperate pride, misdirected into a decision such as I'll never let them hurt me again. The way never to be heard, he decides, is never to feel anything. But an emotional repression cannot be complete. When all other emotions are stifled, a single one takes over, fear. The element of fear was involved in the process of the child's moral destruction from the start. His victimized virtues were not the only cause. His faults were active as well. Fear of others, particularly of adults, fear of independence, of responsibility, of loneliness, as well as self-doubt and the desire to be accepted, to belong. But it is the involvement of his virtues that makes his position so tragic and later so hard to correct. As he grows up, his amorality is reinforced and reaffirmed. What is he offered when he reaches college? If he has retained some faint, inarticulate sense of morality's importance, some hope of finding moral guidance, a course in freshman ethics will extinguish it.
He is offered, in essence, three schools of ethics. The mystical, which holds that the will of God is the criterion of ethics. The social, which holds that the good of society is the criterion of ethics. And the subjectivist, which dispenses with criteria and, in fact, with ethics. The mystical school tells him that he is depraved by birth, tainted with original sin, that selfishness is his blackest fault, that self-sacrifice is the highest virtue, and that he must suffer on earth in order to earn rewards beyond the grave, which means that the purpose of ethics is to prepare him for death, not to guide him in living. The social school tells him that he is a serf, that he is born to serve them, that the only moral justification of his existence is service to others, that selfishness is his blackest fault, that self-sacrifice is the highest virtue, and that ethics condemns him to a life sentence at hard labor to achieve the happiness of others, which means that the purpose of ethics is the happiness of everyone except himself. An eager young mind seeking the guidance of reason cannot take the supernatural seriously and is impervious to the ethics of mysticism. It does not take him long to perceive the contradictions and the sickeningly self-abasing hypocrisy of the social school of ethics. The only influence these two schools may have on him is to reinforce his skeptical indifference to ethics and confirm explicitly the dichotomy he had sensed, the practical versus the moral. The notion that morality is not merely impractical, but impracticable, that it demands self-torture and self-destruction, that if one wants to be practical, that is, if one wants to live, one must reject all thought of moral values and forget all moral ideals. But the worst influence of all in his psychological context is the subjectivist school. In one variant or another, ethical subjectivism is the ruling doctrine in today's universities and therefore in today's society. It permeates and suffocates every aspect of our culture. It is the product of epistemological agnosticism, of the revolt against reason, which has been gathering momentum since Immanuel Kant and is now the raging mainstream of modern philosophy. Notions such as reason is impotent to know things as they are, reality is unknowable, certainty is impossible, knowledge is mere probability, truth is that which works, mind is a superstition, logic is a social convention, these are the wreckage, the flotsam and jetsam tossed about by that mainstream. With such a view of reason's power and validity in the realm of cognition, what could one expect in the realm of moral evaluation? Ethics, according to the subjectivist school, lies outside the province of reason. It is the province and the exclusive monopoly of feelings. Ethics, they declare, is a matter of subjective preference, that is, of irrational choice. It is nothing but an unwarranted command or an arbitrary postulate or an emotional commitment. Ethical propositions, they declare, have no cognitive meaning and are merely a report on one's feelings or the equivalent of emotional ejaculations. <laughs> An emotion divorced from reason and from the facts of reality, an emotion whose cause one does not know and does not care to discover, is a whim. United in their hatred of reason, the three schools of ethics agree that whim is the ultimate standard of morality. 
and they fight one another only over the question of whose whim, God's, society's, or one's own. The most consistent products of today's education who have accepted subjectivist ethics in full are the grotesque phenomena known as the activists of the so-called student rebellion exemplified at the University of California at Berkeley. They scream that they know nothing but want to rule everything, that they have no coherent ideology but want to remake the world, that there are no moral principles and that they are morally entitled to achieve their goals by means of physical force by grace of the fact that that is what they want and they want it now. These are the living embodiments of modern philosophy. They are not an attractive sight. But what does subjectivism do to the silent victim, the forgotten man of today's education, the intelligent, sensitive, rational youth who has learned to repress his values, but who hoped to find moral guidance in college? He knows that the subjective means the arbitrary, the irrational, the blindly emotional. These are the elements which he has come to associate with people's attitudes in moral issues and to dread. When formal philosophy tells him that ethics, by its very nature, is closed to reason and can be nothing but a matter of subjective choice, this is the kiss or seal of death on his moral development. His conscious conviction now unites with the subconscious feeling that value choices come from the mindless element in people and are a dangerous, unknowable, unpredictable enemy. His conscious decision is not to get involved in moral issues. Its subconscious meaning is not to value anything, or worse, not to value anything too much not to hold any irreplaceable, non-expendable values. From this to the policy of a moral coward existentially and to an overwhelming sense of guilt psychologically is not a very long step for an intelligent man. The result is such men as the one I described and a type of neurosis prevalent among the best of today's intellectuals. Let it be said to their credit that they are unable to adjust to their inner contradictions. As a rule, they achieve an early professional success and that very success breaks them psychologically. It exposes their value vacuum, their lack of personal purpose, and thus the self-abnegating futility of their work. They know even though not in fully conscious terms, that they are achieving the opposite of their original goals and motives. Instead of leading a rational, that is reason-guided and reason-motivated life, they are gradually becoming moody, subjectivist whim worshippers, acting on the range of the moment, particularly in their personal relationships, by default of any firmly defined values. Instead of reaching independence from the irrationality of others, they are being forced by the same default into blind dependence on and compliance with the value systems of others into a state of abject conformity. Instead of pleasure, the glimpse of any higher value or nobler experience brings them pain, guilt, terror, and prompts them not to seize it and fight for it, but to escape, to evade, to betray it, or to apologize for it, in order to placate the standards of the conventional men whom they despise. The glimpses of higher values have all but vanished from today's culture. If in one of his better moments, 
a repressor tried to reach for some inspiring experience, some form of spiritual fuel, where would he find it? The great field of lifelong education from which one never graduates, whose classrooms stand open from cradle to grave, the university that gives no diplomas, only the fuel to pass all of life's exams, is art. What does today's art have to offer him? The image of man that emerges from the art of our time is the gigantic figure of an aborted embryo whose limbs suggest a vaguely anthropoid shape, who twists his upper extremity in a frantic quest for a light that cannot penetrate its empty sockets, who emits inarticulate sounds resembling snarls and moans, who crawls through a bloody muck, red froth dripping from his jaws, and pauses periodically and lifting the stumps of his arms screams in abysmal terror at the universe at large. Granting today's philosophy, this image and the sense of life it embodies are correct. Such is man deprived of reason. The cult of despair and depravity, the worship of psychotics and brutes, the fall from the conceptual level of man's consciousness past the perceptual level, down to the stupor of mere sensory stimuli, the screams of terror, the grunts of guilt, and the maudlin whining of pleas for pity, such is today's sense of life mirrored faithfully in art. What will this type of art do to the repressor who seeks to recapture a different sense of life? It will make him abandon art and run from any aesthetic experience in righteous but inarticulate and therefore impotent revulsion and indignation. It will confirm his feeling that life is a sewer and values are only an illusion, the product of his unrealistic weakness to be hidden as his guilty secret. Romantic art is virtually non-existent today present company accepted. <laughs> it requires a view of man incompatible with modern philosophy. Romanticism sees man not as a helpless pawn of fate, but as a being who possesses the power of volition, whose life is directed by his own value choices. Romanticism is a value-oriented, morality-centered movement. Its material is not journalistic minutiae, but the abstract, the essential, the universal principles of man's nature, and its basic commandment is Aristotle's, to portray man as he might be and ought to be. The guilt of today's educational system is that romantic art is not merely unpracticed, but virtually unknown, even as a matter of history. It is treated not merely as if it did not exist, but as if it had never existed. I know of a prominent university whose students had never heard of Victor Hugo. Predominantly, however, they do hear his name and that is about all. Yet man's need of a ray of romanticism's light is enormous and tragically eager. Observe the sensational popularity of romantic thrillers, of detective and secret agent stories. These thrillers represent the primitive elementary level of the romantic school of art. It, in simplified symbolic terms, they dramatize one of man's widest and most crucial abstractions, the abstraction of moral conflict, of man's efficacy, of his ability to fight for his values and to achieve them. And the most shameful symptom of the moral bankruptcy of our age is the attempt to spit in the face of man's profound moral hunger 
by trying to present the thrillers tongue in cheek. If one seeks an embodiment of moral cowardice, the tongue in cheek thrillers are it. Humor is often used as an apology for evil, but here it is used as an apology for virtue, which morally is the more contemptible policy. What are such mixed thrillers laughing at? At values, at man's struggle for values, at man's capacity to achieve his values, at man, at man the hero. To whom are they apologizing? To the sewer school of art. In today's culture, the gutter worshiper needs and makes no apology, but the hero worshiper is expected to crawl on his belly crying, I didn't mean it, boys. Don't take me seriously. I was only kidding. I'm not so corrupt as to believe in virtue. I'm not so cowardly as to fight for my values. I'm not so evil as to long for an ideal. I am one of you. What will such mixed thrillers do to the repressor who is seeking courage for a better view of life? They will drive his repression deeper. They will confirm his notion that values are not to be taken seriously. They will sanction his moral cowardice. They will teach him to smirk at his own enjoyment and to spit in his own face. <coughs> if he still rebels for a moment and asks why, why must he laugh at heroes? He will hear from the mouth of erudition stuffed, college polished, cocktail brandishing sophisticates, the voice of his Aunt Rosalie saying, life is not like that. No, he does not have to give in. The ultimate choice is his and will always be his. But everything that can be done by others to destroy him is being done today by his family, by his friends, by his teachers, by his public leaders, by all those who express such volubly anxious concern for the fate and welfare of youth. He will need an almost superhuman effort to resist their inhuman pressure, but he can resist it and he can solve his psychological problems. His treason to his romantic art values is not the primary cause of his neurosis, but it is one of its most revealing symptoms and it can give him a clear objective test of his inner state. If he finds himself fearing, evading, and negating the highest experience possible to man, a state of unclouded exaltation, he can know that he is in profound trouble and that his only alternative is either to check his value premises from scratch, from the start, from the repressed, forgotten, betrayed figure of his particular Buck Rogers and painfully to reconstruct his broken chain of normative abstractions or to become completely the kind of monster he is in those moments when, with an obsequious giggle, he tells some fat babbit that exaltation is impractical. If he chooses this last, who is responsible besides himself? Everyone and no one. A destruction of that magnitude cannot be done by any one person. It is the product of an entire culture. And today's culture is the product of men like himself, men who had known better in their youth and have spent their lives trying to forget it. Such is the pattern of the moral emasculation of an entire society. Of any one group, 
the most influential and therefore the guiltiest are today's educators. It is a country's universities that set its premises, its thinking, its values, its goals, and its trends. And part of the modern educator's guilt is the fact that blinded by the bankruptcy of philosophy, they do not know the nature and extent of their own power. Two things are signally lacking in today's education, values and reason. For those who are not ready to give up, these two are the signposts of a new direction and of man's desperate need, a need of any age, but most desperately of youth, a value-oriented art to awaken and support a moral sense of life and a rational philosophy to validate it, to implement it, and to translate it into reality. Just as romantic art is a man's first glimpse of a moral sense of life, so it is his last hold on it, his last lifeline. Romantic art is the fuel and the spark plug of a man's soul. Its task is to set a soul on fire and never let it go out. The task of providing that fire with a motor and a direction belongs to philosophy. I thank you.